Um, again, I, I want to welcome everybody here today. We're glad that uh, you're here. This is really the central part of our worship service when we open up God's Word. We've been uh, going through the life and teachings of Jesus, and I'd like to ask that you turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. Um, you can find that, by the way, on page 702 in our church Bibles. If you didn't bring your own Bible with you today, really want to encourage you to, to pick up one of the Bibles around you and the chairs around you. You can find the passage that we're going to be looking at on page 702, and we're going to read together um, this teaching of Jesus. We're now uh, really in that last week of Jesus' life, and um, I guess just a little bit of orientation to this passage as you turn to it. We're in the Gospel of Matthew. As we've been going through this, you've probably noticed that uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all tell the story of Jesus, but they do it just each a little bit differently. The Gospel of Mark, as an example, tells a lot about the events in Jesus' life, the things that happened. Um, Matthew, as an example, talks a lot more and relates a lot more of his teachings. In fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, if you begin to study it, uh, there are a whole big sections of Jesus' teachings. They're lumped into to five different areas, uh, the first of which begins in chapter 5. It's a Sermon on the Mount. And then, and then there are more teachings as you go through. And uh, we're going to read today at the end of the fifth of those sections. So in the Gospel of Matthew, he writes all about the things that Jesus taught. He writes it in five sections. We're going to read from that fifth section, and we're going to read the very end of everything that he had to say. And I, I mention that just so that you can anticipate what we're going to read. If, if, you're, if you're Matthew and you've been struck by everything that Jesus has taught, and so you want to relate it to people, um, maybe you would save the best for last. Maybe whatever was going to be at the very end would be at the heart of what it was that Jesus taught. And so as we're about to read this, I just suggest to you that we can anticipate that, that this is, is where it's at in Matthew's view of who Jesus was and what he was all about. And we're going to begin reading in verse 31. Uh, Jesus is teaching, he says this, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And by now, as we've been studying the teachings of Jesus, you realize that he uses these metaphors to describe what's going to happen and, and, and how to understand his kingdom. And he's talking now about what's going to happen at the end, when Jesus returns, when time is rolled up. You know, this life can be a little bit complicated, right? It's like when it all gets sorted out. Uh, the metaphor here is of a shepherd separating the sheep from the goats. And the idea here is at the end of time, when Jesus is sitting on his throne and a judgment happens, there'll be some who will go to the right of Jesus and some who will go to the left. Reading on here in verse 34, it says, The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick and in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he'll say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. And maybe you get a sense of the high stakes of this passage, right? It's like, sort 
all of life out, when, when time is done and, and when everything is finished, when Jesus is, is dividing people from people, some to go to eternal life, some to go to eternal punishment, um, there are, are, are certain things that, that are mentioned here that they're going to play this big role. And I want to just draw your attention to it so that as Christians we can understand what it is. And um, I'm convinced that there's just something so important here that as Christians we need to listen to. A couple observations about this passage. Keep your Bibles open. I, I want you to see this. Uh, first of all, both Jesus when he tells a story and Matthew when he writes it down uses a particular technique in storytelling that we ought to pay attention to. It's a technique of repetition. I want you to see this. So he, he, he turns to those who are on the right, and if you look with me at verse 35, he says, okay, you are, you're blessed. Come into my kingdom, he says, for... And then there are what I'll call six needs with six corresponding actions that are listed out here. Need number one, I was hungry. Corresponding action, you gave me something to eat. Need number two... I was thirsty. Corresponding action, you gave me something to drink. Need number three, I was a stranger. Corresponding action, you invited me in. Need number four, I needed clothes. You clothed me. Need number five, I was sick. You look after me. Need number six, I was in prison. Corresponding action, you came to visit me. So you see that list there? How There are these six needs with six corresponding actions. So he says, this is the reason why you're blessed. Come into my kingdom for you did all these things. Then, I mean, it, just as easily he could have told the story. Uh, the people could have asked, Lord, when did we do these things? But both Jesus and Matthew take the time to, to list these things out again. Look with me at verse 37. The righteous will answer him, Lord, number one, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Number two, or thirsty and give you something to drink. Number three, a stranger and invite you in. Number four, or needing clothes and clothe you. Number five, when did we see you? Six, or number six, in prison and go to visit you. So again, he lists out all these needs and their corresponding actions. But now, just to make the point even stronger, repeats this entire list one more time. He turns to the left and uh, he says, all right, depart from me. You're cursed. Go away to eternal punishment. Four, look at verse 42 with me. I was, number one, hungry. And you gave me nothing to eat. I was, number two, thirsty. You gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger. You did not invite me in. I needed clothes. You didn't clothe me. Number five, I was sick. Number six, and in prison. And you did not look after me. You see how this list is repeated? And and that's not enough. If you look at their answer, they, they then ask, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison. It's like the repetitious school of repetition. Maybe Jesus and Matthew are trying to drill something into our minds. Would you agree? Uh, A couple other observations. First, I want to look at these needs and their corresponding actions. And and I will say, uh, of the corresponding actions, that they seem to be what I'll call minimalistic. It's like the kind of least you could do when faced with these needs. So it's not that these people who are on his right, who go away to eternal life, uh, have crossed oceans, have climbed mountains. It's not as though when uh, there are people in prison, they've liberated them, or when they were sick, they healed them, or when they were thirsty, they dug them a well. it's, It's much simpler than that. There are people who are hungry, and you gave them something to eat. There are people who are thirsty, you gave them something to drink. There are people who didn't have clothes. You said, here, here's some clothes. There are people who are sick. You just looked after them. There are people who are in prison. You just went to visit them. You see that? It's like, it's not the most you could possibly do. It's just these little actions, ways that people cared. Third observation I'll make about the text, it's about those who are on the left, the goats, who are going 